the one pivotal moment that led me to leave a very comfortable and cushy six-figure creative director role at a purpose-driven creative consultancy. On paper, everything was lush, yet there was something scratching at me. I was always curious, like, what would I be able to do if I used my creativity and applied it to building my own thing? Creativity for me means being aware of the one thing you control in this life, how we creatively respond to life. The myth that creativity is reserved for the chosen few, it's available to everyone. If you're a human, you are born creative. It's what makes us human. It was the hardest thing I've ever been through in my life and I've been through some shit. What do I have to lose when one day I'm going to lose it all? When life is too important to be taken seriously, don't take it too seriously. Welcome back to the Culmination Project. I'm your host, Cole Blackburn, and today I have on my podcast Pia Leichter. Is it pronounced Leichter? Yeah? Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> she is a uh, coach that I met on Twitter uh, about a year ago, and ever since we've been just kind of chopping it up and become good friends, and i um, just going to have her uh, run down her story, a little bit about her background, and some pivotal moments that led to where she's at now. So how's it going, Pia? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, for sure. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. So maybe give us a little rundown about what you are currently up to and kind of what brings you alive, lights you up. And then I like to talk about on this podcast, pivotal moments for people. Um, of what got them to where they are now and sort of really big realizations, awakenings, you might call it, um, that were either gradual or um, more, I guess you could say, exponential <laughs> um, in nature. And so, yeah, just kind of start riffing and we'll we'll go from there. Sounds good. Um, it's interesting because there's a more than one pivotal moment. There's a series of like under current transformations yeah. that were leading me to doing what I'm excited about doing right now, uh, which is many things. I work as a, just a brief background, I work as a creative coach and I partner with visionary founders, executives, creatives, and artists to help give birth to their creative venture, brand, idea, book that they're really looking to bring to life and need to do so in partnership. Nice. Usually what stops us is not creativity. I believe we're all born creative, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Um, we get in our own way in some way. So that's where the power of coaching and creativity, I think, are a combo that really helps bring to life the dreams that are really asking to be born. So that's a short and sweet of what I'm doing. Yeah. Right now, client work, working with my, I like to call people I work with partners, but it gets very confusing for people. Yeah. <laughs> say that. But so, but generally the wonderful humans and creatives that I get a chance to work with um, just blow my mind. So that's always exciting me. But besides that, I recently started a few, maybe four in October, um, working on my writing a book for the, my first creative nonfiction book ever. Before nice. I talk about that, I'll share something that, that came up when I was reflecting on it. Actually, the book, I started writing the book before I even knew I was writing it. A year ago, I started my newsletter and I thought there was something in me like, you know, there are strategic reasons, but then there is also just this creative impetus. Like I, I really want to connect differently to people rather than short form and create a deeper conversation. And so I started weekly, you know, writing a newsletter, which I call field notes. And through the whole year, actually, it was kind of like ideas for my book book was they were crystallizing and they were forming underneath the surface but I just didn't realize that they were happening yeah. so I think it's really beautiful to remember that sometimes pivotal moments they're actually these really subtle invisible like I don't even know if it's transformative but just behaviors or practices that are happening under the surface and you don't even know it but when you allow yourself to follow your gut or like listen to what's calling mm -hmm. there's usually a reason so you're kind of like you're already in that creative process without realizing it. So that dawned on me recently, which was like, oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> I've been writing my book for a while without even knowing I'm writing it. Yeah. So then finally, when the opportunity came my way to write this book with hybrid pro publishers, then it was just like everything just clicked. Like, yes, I understand what I would write about. So basically, it's called Welcome to the Creative Club, How to Make Life Your Biggest Art Project Yet. 
and it debunks, smashes the myth that creativity is reserved for the chosen few. It's available to everyone. Yeah. If you're a human, you are born creative. It's what makes us human, right? Yeah. <laughs> and invites people not only to access their own innate creativity, mm -hmm. but to apply it to the biggest art project of them all, which is your life, right? right. So I combine my own life lessons, moments where I lost and found my creative power, because mm -hmm. it's really easy to do. And this happens also in subtle ways. And those are really vulnerable moments usually when you lose, you know, the lost and yeah. found part. The found, not so much, the losing. Uh. So I share like life lessons, um, neuroscience research, my own experience working with creativity for over a decade in creative agencies, and really uh, like practical, practical techniques that, that you can use. So the book is meant to be an experience, not just something that's consumed, yeah. but something that can be like applied and used. So super excited about it. That's awesome. That's what I'm doing that I'm like client work, my business, building this to that, um, and also really, you know, writing this book. And I just handed in the first very rough draft uh, of the entire book last week. So it's very fresh and I'll be moving on to the crowdsourcing campaign to, you know, for the pre-sell of the book and get people to join the creative club, the circle and get on board to help bring this, my help. I'm, that's really cool. Cause I'm asking people to do what I do now, help me bring this to life. Yeah. Right? Um, so, Excellent. and that's going to stretch me in all types of wildly uncomfortable ways. And I welcome it. Cause that's how, you know, you're growing <laughs> when things are like, oh, oh, yeah. oh. Um, so, so <laughs> I'm excited about it all. And that's what I'm up to. Awesome. Super cool. Um, so a couple questions in there. I noticed you mentioned, um, so when you lose the creative process, right? Would you, like in my experience, it's been, it's not, I'm not, not actually losing it. There's just this idea that I've lost it, right? Mm. And it's not actually, it's like the illusion of losing it, right? And so how, how, how would you say that you're able to, what would you tell people like who like her like I'm in a you know a block of sorts or I feel like I've lost my creativity like like what is the path or sort of way that they can try out to test for themselves to sort of curtail out of that yeah sure I'll uh, no, to when I, before I answer that I want to say something sure, yeah. I think losing losing your creative power it also comes from in small ways that you might not even be aware of, forgetting that you have the power in the first place mm. to design your days, to design your experience, and kind of starting to follow someone else's script. It happens to all of us. It's not, you know, follow the script of what success looks like, what the path needs to be. And slowly you start reading someone else's lines. Yeah. You're no longer writing your own story. And that's what I mean when I say like losing the creative power, which is losing the my my protagonist role that I get to write the story that life is not just happening to me that I it's happening for me and through me and with me and I get to play a part in that a, a main character role you know um so I think there are moments in life where that shake us awake to remember yeah and this is really what the book is a call to remember you yes know, who you are and what you're capable of and the power you contain and the yeah. story writing skills you have and that it's not you're not in the and it, you're not just the one that it's happening to, you're happening with and with it. So that's what I mean. Yeah. In terms of your 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 question, and there are pivotal moments that help you find it again. Mm -hmm. That make you first yeah. you need the awareness. Shit, I'm following someone else's yeah. script yes. here. What what I don't even want this. Like what's happening? Like I forgot that I get a chance to choose. I get it, I'm a like a natural born creator. I get to create this, right? move into this like consumption consumption mode and usually it's like big pivotal moments or triggers that snap us out make us realize who we are mm -hmm. so in terms of blocks creative blocks oftentimes it's losing that connection to what you really want to create looking at what other people might be doing that can be a big block Instead of wondering like what is it that I I, I want to make, not what it should look like, not what Jane or Harry or you know whoever yeah. is doing, but really like what is it and like how does that connect to what feels very meaningful and purposeful to you? Sure. And I think when you that's just I mean there are many different ways, but that's just one way to to reconnect. 
to your own creativity. What's something you said there, like the awareness piece. That is mm-hmm. that is the biggest piece because as soon as you're aware, then you're like, oh, I'm following somebody else's script. And like that understanding totally. alone can motivate us, I've found, to like dig deep and find what's actually ours, which is something we were 100%. talking about before we even hopped on the podcast too, is like that, yeah. that aspect of like seeing where it is that I am parroting, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> something that I've been taught or shown or, or in some, in in, a lot of times it's like because of comparison or like I should, there's like a should behind it. Like I should be doing it this way or or I shouldn't do it this way versus like what's actually the underneath layer, the layer underneath that, which when those shoulds and shouldn'ts are removed actually expresses itself despite what anybody might think. (laughs) Totally. That's, I mean, the shoulds, shooting yourself to death yeah. is the, is the big creative blocker. Right. That will totally get in your way. Right. Because you're, you're disconnecting from what you could do. Right. Right. Instead of thinking about what you should do. Right. Right. So I think it's really powerful. And you're around awareness. There is no change without awareness. You cannot change what you're not aware of. Exactly. And there are different things that, that bring, bring how we see the world, how we're operating in the world to our awareness. Mm-hmm. You know, different situations that kind of, I don't know if the words are wake us up, but at least um, make us, give us a different way of seeing. Right. And there's, I think a lot of times there's this paradoxical element of like just timing. Like you mentioned um, in terms of like you're, you, you're writing a book, but you didn't even really know at the time that you're writing mm-hmm. a book. So maybe you can speak to this, but how I experience things like that, it's like almost like I have a premonition of what's going. Like I can yeah. see like kind of the next thing on the horizon, but it's not clear yet. It's like putting together puzzle pieces of a big puzzle. And I'm like, I know it's leading to something. And I know like that for you, it was the newsletter. It, like you felt compelled to do that. And then eventually did you sort of see that the puzzle coming together and see how it was starting to fit with what you were doing into this bigger thing like the book? It's like most things, it's hindsight. Yeah. I didn't see it actually literally within like the past 24 hours. I was like, oh my God, I feel like I've been preparing for this for a long. Oh shit, I have been preparing for this for a long. The yeah. ideas have been germinating. I have yeah. been expressing like I have been. So I don't, I think what you're touching on is trust. Trust, faith, whatever word resonates most, right? Like you, you will not, you will not, especially in any creative process, you will not see the puzzle coming together when you're in it. You can't because you're in the middle of putting it together. So you cannot see what is not created yet. And so there is a certain amount of, I don't know, some people surrender, you know, just allowing what is and trusting. Like, I don't know what's going to come out of this, but something, spidey sense, gut, intuition, is calling me to do this work and I'm going to follow it and trust that there's, there's, there's some kind of rhyme or reason behind it. Right. And then just allowing yourself to do it. So I think those are all really important, important components of any creative process, you know, trust, letting go, letting go of outcome and play, make it fun. Like it's fun. What, 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 what's it going to be? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. You know? Yeah. Play is like the ultimate. That's like, that's like where creativity comes from. Right. It's because it's it's because it's natural. It's in the moment. It's spontaneous. Right. Um, Versus where what you were talking about earlier, like when we get in these sort of blocks or like lose the creativity, that's how you can tell. Number one, you've lost the play. And number two, that I'm following somebody else's narrative because then it becomes very boxed in. It becomes very like limited. And that's I think seeing that that's where the awareness piece to me comes in is like seeing that. Oh, I've lost the connection. I've lost the uh, just kind of almost haphazardness or spontaneity of just enjoying this process, right? And I'm and I'm focused now on a, some sort of like end game or or something I've been told I should want or right, um, which loses 100%. that connection and loses that trust. Totally. Yeah. There's so much in what you just said that's really powerful. Um, I think creativity ultimately is is a beautiful expression of your unique self. Yeah. And that's one of a kind. 
you know, so when you connect to what moves you, to what speaks to you, to what calls you, and you create from that place, I think there's, there's nothing more powerful because no one can replicate it because it's you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think that is, that's the beauty. And I think we can lose sight of that when we look at, because it also feels very vulnerable. But when we look at, oh, that person must have it figured out. I'm going to create the thing they're creating so I could feel safe, so I could feel successful, so I could, but what they're creating works for them. That's their desire. Right. That's their calling, right? right? Or not, maybe they're modeling someone else, who knows, but, and, and, and it's not yours. And so I think the, the root of this all is to figure out what's yours and create from that place and create that thing. Yeah. And there's so much possibility that opens up and there's a lot of beauty in it too. So I'd like to know, you know, what, you know, going back to your story, like what, what are some of those pivotal moments that have happened over the last maybe 10 years that have opened you up to this form of creativity that you're in now? Oy. Or however you want, however you want to present <laughs> it. Just what are like what are some of the progressions <laughs> that have happened? Like if you want, if you don't mind. I don't believe that it has to be through hardship. Like I don't want to subscribe to that narrative that like you know to mm, awaken you have to go through shit. But oftentimes, for me, <laughs> it's usually been something that's really shook me up to get mm -hmm. out of the headspace I was in, to get out of the drama I was in, if I lost the plot or something, or to grow. Um, I can answer, I'll give a very specific answer and then there are more of these, but the one pivotal moment that led me to leave a very comfortable and cushy six-figure creative director role at a purpose-driven creative consultancy where I was doing using creativity for good. And on paper, everything was lush. Like, yeah. why? I'm working with creativity. I'm judging awards. Everything is, I mean, it's all good. Yeah. Right? I'm using it for good. I'm working with amazing people, amazing clients, big brands. Yet there was something scratching at me. I was always curious, like, what would I be able to do if I used my creativity and applied it to building my own thing mm. without a ceiling, without a wall, without nothing, like just open space. Like, what would it look like? Right. If I just got out of the structure for whatever reason, probably because I was damn comfortable and because it was pretty good. It's not like there was something like wrong or I hated it at all. I enjoyed the work, but it kind of kept me in place for a long time. And just that scratch, it would be like, you know, something scratching me and then I'd be like, get off. <laughs> It would go, then it would come back and mm, yeah, scratch harder on and off. And most of the time, <laughs> yeah, it's not, it wasn't working. It was just like, okay, I'm, but I'm good. It's all good, you know? And then COVID hit or Corona or what, whatever. It was. And then my, my, my mom died suddenly mm. in the middle of, of, she had a stroke and she passed away in 2021. And I, and I walked her home. So I, I, I flew, she was living in Mexico and, I've never been close to death before, not that close. Yeah. You know, I mean, not to mention um, it was the hardest thing I've ever been through in my life, and I've been through some shit. But the it kind of it death just smacked me awake in a way nothing else ever has in my whole life. Mm. Like the realization, I don't know for some reason I felt like death was this abstract concept <laughs> that could never yeah. happen to other people. Yeah. Like it, I just never really registered. <laughs> Um, that it would come for me or to anyone around me, maybe denial, I don't know, whatever, just never really registered until that happened. And when that happened, every life felt surreal, felt like everything mattered and nothing mattered. Mm. Like, why not, you know, not in that moment, but afterwards when I came home, it was like, why not try to build my own thing? Like, what do I have to lose when one day I'm going to lose it all? Yeah, that's a huge realization. Right. It's pretty logical yeah. to hang on to things or, be, you know, you know, it's like, fuck it. Got a really good case of the fuck it's, you know, mm -hmm. and I was just like, fuck it. My mom gave me a few passing gifts and one of them was courage, mm -hmm. the courage to like, I got this one life, got this one precious life. Like, what am I going to do with it? Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bet on myself. I'm going to jump. And so I did like shortly after my mom passed and I came back home. I, I, I left my job. I also needed time, time that wasn't available in that situation. So just to heal and, you know, scream at the 
moon and cry and do all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and yeah, so, so then I just jumped and I started to, to build a collective studio. And uh, at first I had no idea because I, I did a coaching certification, which was massive source of support during this time as well. Um, and I loved it. Coaching to me was like also the art of transformation. It was another form of creativity. So it, even though it sounds very different, it felt so aligned. And then I also had my creative work in the background and I felt like two very separate worlds. It's like, how, how the hell am I going to create a solid business from these <laughs> two separate worlds? Right. And if I listen to people, people are like, oh, you need to have one clear offer and one clear, you know, client <laughs> avatar. And otherwise it's not yeah. going to work. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I didn't start building my business to be told what I should be building and how I should be building. Not to right. sound like that's, I didn't leave my cushy salary job for that. No, right. I'm, you know, I'm going to try to find, does, I'll learn from other people. Don't get me wrong, but I need to find a way of building and what I'm building that feels deeply meaningful to me. Right. And I didn't know, I didn't know how are these two things going to mix. And the reason I'm sharing this is because sometimes it took me a year and a half to figure for the pieces to start to come together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still had work and I was still doing things, but it just, I was like, what is this? What exactly is it? And then there was a pivotal point where I was like, I think I can start to see the invisible threads are becoming visible, the web of how dots connect and I need help. So I started working with a creative coach drinking my own Kool-Aid yeah. and we were able to connect, <laughs> connect the dots of, oh, like how my story and my life and my experience brought me to this point to offer exactly what I can offer as a creative coach and partner for people. Right. And then I was like, whoa, light bulb. And it will change again, by the way. I'm not, it's not a fixed point. Like I'll continue to grow and I'm sure I'll go through this again at some point. But my point is, this is about the puzzle pieces we spoke about. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're not going to see the picture. Sometimes it might take a year before you see the picture. But if you enjoy what you're doing and you feel like, no, I'm on it. I'm on the path. I don't know what the horizon looks like yet or the destination exactly. Mm -hmm. But I'm on the path and it feels good. I just need to keep on trusting and keep on learning. Because I was like, I needed to learn. Like, oh, what is it about coaching? What is it about creativity? It needs to change. What does all this stuff come together? And to just trust, this is so overused now but it's really true trust your process not just the process but trust your process and eventually it will become clearer right and it might not be what you expected it to be yeah that's the other thing that's it never is (laughs) like it almost like it almost never (laughs) is like that i can not not that i can like (laughs) think of well and that's that's what I kind of met earlier when I was talking about like premonition. Like I know this is going somewhere and the more I trust and lean into yeah. it, 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 things open up and I feel more at ease during the process. The more I'm able to actually trust that the intuition, even though my mind wants to know mm-hmm. this concrete idea of where is this going and how's this going to look like the intuitions, ne- it never gives a solid idea. It's just like, just follow me. Just trust me. You know, and our the mind, the ego, which is just what it does. It's not wrong or bad. It's just it wants to know, you know, exactly what's going to happen. It wants to keep us protected, like physically. That's what it's designed to do. And so that gets in the way oftentimes, which something you said about um, about you're not you don't subscribe to like having to have, you know, these big openings happen through something negative or through something that's like challenging or counter to that is like that's just how it happens a lot of times right it's not that you have you have to make that happen or you have to like put yourself in a shitty situation in order to like wake up but i think the idea is is you you had that little itch right you had that scratch and Mm -hmm. you knew it was there like you heard it but you may not have actually acted on it until a year later or two years later or whatever and so a lot of times what i've found in my own life is when i don't listen early on it gets harder like the 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 calling gets louder and louder and louder which tends to cause challenge and like hardship if i don't listen and so i think in the beginning early on when people are various when someone's very asleep like and they're very programmed they're very on their track to whatever they're told they're supposed to be doing and they hear that call, it's very, it's like a whisper, and then it gets louder and louder and louder. Mm-hmm. And, and then eventually 
something has to break in my life in order for me to actually, because I, I, then I have no choice. It's like, I don't have a choice at that point. It's like every, something's broken and now I'm broken open. But as we get more aware and more and more, and we have a deeper understanding of how that intuition works and deeper trust in it, then we can listen faster. That's kind of what I found. Like the gap closes, mm -hmm. like, and I can listen faster. I can move faster on it. And it doesn't have to be so hard anymore. So theoretically, it doesn't have to be hard or not that hard, but it often is because we're just not listening. True. Right. <laughs> True. So. I just I, I said that also to leave leave open the possibility that that, too, is, is a story and there might be other yeah. ways, you know. And yes, yeah. often it is. It is like a wake up call. Like you get shook. Something shakes you up. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you wake up in a way or you see things differently. You're like, oh, my God, what am I doing? Um, but I would like to believe that there might be other paths. There might be other yeah. ways that, yeah. that, you know, I mean, for me, it's usually been a really strong shake, like, a you know, mm -hmm. my head's going back and forth. But, but yeah, and I think the intuition part, I think we need to slow down and get quiet, mm -hmm. whatever that looks like to you. It could be walking to anything. To also hear, to learn how to listen. Because there are yeah. a lot of voices within there are a lot there could be nudges and itches but maybe some of it's the ego ego mind maybe it's like how do you discern what is my intuition what is my ego what is my inner saboteur what is my inner wise one and i think yes partnership you can do that oh you of course but also just learn like slowing it down and being with yourself yeah. meeting yourself and getting curious and observing like oh so that you can recognize when the itch or the nudge is is your your gut is an intuitive feel right and trust and follow it so in your experience what would you say are some of the hallmarks of knowing the difference between a more like egoic you know pleasure seeking desire and something that's more genuine like a genuine call I think, depending on the situation, sometimes it's easier to decipher others. It can be a bit more confusing. But I think, um, for me, I can only speak for myself. When my intuition speaks or my inner wise one speaks, um, it's usually clear, direct, and I can feel it in my body. Sometimes I, I get, um, I get like the chills mm. everywhere. So if I'm talking with, a, speaking with a client. And they say something, I'll just get the chills. And sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. So I might offer and say, oh, I just got the chills. I don't know if that's relevant to sharing with you. Is that something, you know, that was very meaningful or that? Um, so it speaks to me through my body and it, it, it has a certain cadence and way of, of communicating that, that my egoic mind is usually fast. Yeah. It's like a machine gun fire and very direct and 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 it's it's like a bit noisy and overtaking it's a different energy yeah it's a different energy and it's usually here you know or sometimes in my gut it's a bit like lower or it's like through my body so there's no like one size fits all way of of tapping into what feels like you're what's true for you and what's not just the chatter of the mind but practices like meditation at least for me yeah. are helpful because then i get to observe the feelings the thoughts whatever is coming up for me um and then I, and then that that helps create sort of a, an awareness <laughs> right <laughs> back to that right. and that helps discern because sometimes it's, it's it's i think the first step is wait who's talking now what's happening and then so being aware and then choosing which one you follow because you have choices Right. No, I think that's, that's beautifully stated. I, and the reason I like to explore this is because it's like we can hear the same wisdom a thousand different ways, and it might not hit until the mm. right person at the right time says it that certain angle. <laughs> and then it like causes some True. profound epiphany. Right? Shift. Yeah. You, you know, it's interesting. I think uh, back to awareness and these voices within mm. when I'm, with clients, we all have an inner saboteur. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, yes. these are coping me mechanisms that we developed as a child that we were in situations often beyond us that kept us safe 
right? These coping strategies that then become like these inner saboteurs. As you said, it's not a bad, not a bad or good thing, but usually they've outgrown their usefulness trying to keep you safe, right? right. So when I'm with a client, I can, I hear when the saboteur enters our space, mm -hmm. the way the client speaks, what the client says, I, it's like, and then I'll, you know, just become aware like, oh, that's interesting. Sounds like the saboteur just entered the room. Like, right. did you, you know, what, what, what is this? What do you think? Like, you know, what's coming up for you? And kind of go, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> and then we might break it down. Like, oh, what does it sound like? It was faster. It was this. And then you can also hear when and like an inner sage enters the room. Mm -hmm. There's a different cadence to the voice that what, what's being said is different. And so just shining a mirror, a light and going, oh, did you notice? This is interesting. Right. Uh -huh just that awareness takes the charge out and can create a shift without you even doing more than that. I mean, you can, of course, take it and amplify it, but just that can create a tremendous shift. So I think that's interesting, the awareness bit. For sure. And no, I love that because it, it, it literally everything I've found, it all comes back to the awareness piece, all of it. Like it's, it's literally the, sim the simplicity of that and of, and of not denying anything. Right. So like, it's like it's like every time I have a conversation like this or any really any conversation, I like to get as close to just the truth as possible. And so like when the inner saboteur comes up, right, it's like, well, you know, the awareness piece causes us can cause us to get curious about it instead of being like, because mm -hmm. what actually keeps it coming up and playing, you know, us playing whack-a-mole with it, you know, is pushing it away. Yes, and being like, no, I don't want to see this. This is bad. This is wrong. This is not good, right? Which is just like the parent ego coming in and being like, no, this shouldn't be, which every time we reject reality, you know, it's, it's a lose game because it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. not honoring totally. what's coming up. And so it usually has a message for us, right? It usually has something it, it wants us to exactly. see or wants us to investigate and say, where did this come from? And like, how can we resolve it so that, so that this voice, this saboteur feels comfortable and safe to have a place at the table without, you know, me having to like latch onto it and be like, oh, this is terrible or, or limit myself in the way that I'm going about life and get caught up in this aspect that's, essentially an old past pre-programming, which can cause the loss of connection to the creative piece, right? Totally. Yeah. So it's, it's about hearing it, but making sure it's not in the driver's seat. Yes. Back you go, nor does it get to ch a chance to pick the radio station. <laughs> yeah. It's like hearing it, being aware of it, and then even more powerfully, what would your inner sage say? Mm -hmm. when the saboteur comes up so being really kind like what would it oh it would say i don't, I don't know we're good we got this thank you yeah <laughs> be on your way like whatever and so also you know bringing up those two sides of you and allowing them to communicate and honoring that they're both present no problem but you get to choose how you want to be with it okay fear is in the room okay judgment's in the room okay the critic is here how do you want to be with it yeah. That's a quite, that's like a powerful question. Oh, I want to be kind or I, I want to push it away and, you know, whatever, whatever comes up for that person. Right. And another thing to remember is that that saboteur will, will pop up and get really, really loud when you're on the precipice of big change. Yeah. It's going to happen. For sure. That's, that's why I talk about it because most of my clients, if you're on the edge of like a big dream, a big change, you're jumping, you're leaping, the saboteur is going to try to keep you safe and be like, hey, come back, come back to the couch. I got some popcorn. Yeah. I got Netflix on. You know, you know, we don't got to do any of this. You could just say safe, not visible. We got, you know, come back, come back, come back. And so it's also normalizing that that's, that's going to happen for all of us to a certain different degrees that the saboteur will get loud when you're right on the, on, on the edge of something big, some right. big shift, some big change. And that that's okay. Well, and that's just the, looking at it's a sign. Yeah. And that's just the truth. The truth is that it, that's what it does. That's its function is to keep, keep us safe. And that's not, that's not wrong. That's just what it does and to see it. And so like yeah. this aspect going back to awareness is like it, the more awareness we have, the more space there is. Right. So like the inner saboteur can like, if there's very little awareness, we, we identify with it and it's like here, 
but the more space really the more like octopus. the more like zooming out it's it's out here then i have a choice of okay do i want to listen to this thought or this thought or this thought or this thought or which is the most useful one given the current situation because there's no mm. you know that's the whole thing about creativity and spontaneity is like there is no pre-programmed right answer it's whatever it's every situation is unique every moment is fresh and so like there is a opportunity to choose what is the most useful most inclusive most harmonious choice and action in that moment instead of going to this like paste on you know paper mache aspect of here's what i was told i should do you know right Absolutely. And I think for me, what you're touching on here is creativity or like creativity for me means being aware of the one thing you control in this life. One thing we control, how we creatively respond to life. Mm. Yeah. That's it. Uh, what's more creative than that? Like, oh, life this is happening in reality this is here how do i want to creatively respond to that how do i want to creatively respond to this so it's like you know you, you start designing your experience mm -hmm. through the awareness that you get to do that yeah. and you do yeah in that process there's less and less reactive patterns or they're at least seen like they don't they aren't they don't hook us so easily Right, they're seeing and they're like, oh, True. that's the reaction. That's the this thought or this thought or this thought that used to hook me and cause a visceral response. And now I get to choose. Now I have choice because I have more awareness. I have more space. The, that's the difference. It's Victor Frankl quote, which I one of my favorites, and I, I'm not going to remember it verbatim, but it's like there's the, the space between stimulus and response is where your freedom lies, right? So stimulus, something happens and you you have a reaction. A reaction is an old pattern playing out, mm -hmm. knee jerk. Yeah. This happens, somebody else at me, I'm gonna honk on my horn. Like I don't even, you don't even think about it. It's like driving, you don't even think, rah, this, rah, 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 that kind of, you know? <laughs> yeah. But if you create the space, oh, this thing happened. Wait, let me stop, create space. How do I wanna, do I wanna honk my horn? Or do I want to even give it that energy? No, I think I'm just going to turn up my music and sing in the car and let the guy cut me off. Whatever, I'm just making stuff yeah. up. But it's like it's a great example. <laughs> that's <laughs> it's that space. Yeah. And that's the difference between reaction and response. They're very to me, those are very two different things. So the reaction is a knee jerk, and that's that's just an old story playing out in your present. How boring is that? You got to like, have the same rerun over and over again with different backdrops. <laughs> Like, that's not creative at all. That's the opposite of creativity. That's yeah. like repetition, yeah. right? So that is, that is, that is giving away your creative power. That's a great example of that, where it's just like, happen, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, wait a minute. I love you know? your expression of this. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just a reminder, and I think it's something we all have the power to choose. We just need to remember that we have the power in the first place. And sometimes it's that awareness of that remembering that is, that it, it not sometimes, it is what is needed in order to choose to respond. Yeah. And if you're not aware that you get to choose, then you won't. Yeah. It reminds me of, um, it's like, if you've ever seen the movie Groundhog's Day with Bill Murray, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I love him. He's so good. like he starts to him. realize every single day is the same and like it's how everybody's pre-programmed or kind of like um the truman show it's kind of a similar theme right um i i often find myself like having a reactive pattern and literally in the middle of the the hook in the middle of the reaction i'll just like laugh my ass off because I know how ridiculous, <laughs> I know how ridiculous, <laughs> and I'll and I'll be able to end it immediately. Like I'll be, I'll feel like the, the the surge of anger or anxiety or whatever the sadness, and I just see it for what it is. And it's not that I, it's not that I end it like, it's not that I'm like, no, this shouldn't be. Or I, it's just it's the awareness, it's the realization that oh, this is happening, and then it's allowed to move through the system. 
And then, yeah. and then I'm just like, I, I laugh because I'm like that, that pattern's still there, but I see it more clearly. So that gap gets smaller. It's like, there's a big, there's a big difference I find in quality of life of when I say, get upset about something for five or 10 minutes, you know, versus all day. Right. Cause then I'm not, then I, I have the five or 10 minutes. I let it play out. I, I feel it. And then I'm able to like go out and interact kindly again and peacefully and at it from a more natural state. Yeah. What you're saying really resonates with me because what you're saying is also be playful, have fun with it. Don't take life <laughs> like Oscar Wilde, you know, life is too important to be taken seriously. Like, yeah. Don't take it too seriously. And I love that you invite laughter <laughs> Because because what could happen is you can create you can activate your own judgment like oh why did I do this thing and then it gets serious and it, it you get stuck in another loop so just being able to like catch yourself and go that shit's funny like being able to laugh at it is 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 such a lighter way of being with it that's a choice too I'm gonna I'm gonna laugh when this shows up and I'm aware I'm just gonna laugh at it it's it's, it's funny as hell yeah. um, rather than come down on yourself or be hard on yourself or judge yourself or push it away or all the other options you got so fun and laughter always an option yeah Something else we forget sometimes that that's why i say in the work sometimes people talk about the work it gets like oh it has to be hard it has right. to be. yeah it can be but it doesn't have to be it could also be light like ram das that beautiful quote you could do it all like it's a, a great weight or you know or you could you know do it all like it's a dance something along those lines right right, right. and that's that's beautiful you get to choose. You can dance with it. You can play with it. You can laugh at it. You, or you could, you know, carry it like it's really heavy. For sure. I think there's a distinction to be made within that, to, from between the difference between like hard work and sometimes the work is just painful because it's like, it's like literally I find myself, un, it's like I'm yeah. undoing and seeing ways that I'm being that are not me, that I've thought were me for a long time and so there's this like this personality shift or this this shift into um it's like letting go of an old friend you know or letting go of like yeah. something that i that i identified with and thought was who i was and so on the level of hard work it can be challenging and, it, and it's it's can be painful to like kind of sever sever that like not even in a like a violent way but just in a like seeing it clearly type way right it's like the clear the more the, it's like and that's one of the kind of the paradox aspects uh, paradoxical aspects i see about the gaining more and more awareness it's like on one hand it's it's inevitable like you can't like that's how life evolves right and on the other hand it's like once once i've seen too much it's like i can't go back so there's like this aspect okay. of like ignorance is bliss, but also it's it's way it, it's more freeing to to break out of that that like smallness and out of that limitation simultaneously. Absolutely, and I I agree. There is a lot of there is grief in when parts of you die that no longer serve. So there is definitely grief, and it can be hard, but I'd like to invite the thought experiment of like what if we could hold both. Yeah. What if it can be hard and painful, and it could also you could also have a laugh from yeah. at yourself while you go through it. Yeah. Like, it doesn't have to be an an either or. Um, I think that's that's what I'm inviting into the space more than anything. That yes, it will it can be very fucking painful, and you can have a laugh in the middle of it. Certainly, <laughs> so, certainly, I mean, it's exciting. Also, simultaneously, that too, right? Because it's like absolutely. It's like the old, it's like the idea of something that's bittersweet, right? It's like something can be bitter and sweet mm. at the same time. Something can be sad and also hold a sense of like ease and completeness totally. and contentness simultaneously. Like, like I've, like I've had in, endings of romantic relationships where I'm like, I know this needed to end and I'm sad about it because it's, I, I am no longer interacting on that level. So there's a piece being let go of and simultaneously there's this like freedom in it. And there's this bigger perspective of like, I, I can't wait to see what unfolds out of this. And I'm excited. And I'm also like thankful and grateful for the experience I just had with this person or this situation. Mm. Right. So there's this like conglomeration of, multiple different perspectives that can be happening simultaneously it's not like we have to just fractal into one 
right? True. Yeah. And we are many. We are we are the kaleidoscope. Funny when it comes to relationships, I, I have caught myself grieving the idea of what could have been mm. more than I grieve what was. Yeah. That's what yes. happens when you have an overactive imagination. <laughs> yeah. And I caught myself in that, and I was like, "Oh my god!" It, that was like a, a aha moment. Like, holy shit! I'm I'm not grieving the person or what we had. I'm grieving what could have been and that I held on to for so long, that was with me for so long, that idea of what could have been. And I right. wasn't even aware I was carrying it until right. it was gone. Because I would look back and go, do I really miss what we, no, maybe not. <laughs> but, yeah. but it was the idea of what it might have been. Right. Um, that was a moment. That was a moment. I mean, yeah, it's tricky. The mind can be very tricky. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because like the, there's – this deeper truth aspect I'll experience with certain relationships where it's like, I know this is for my own good. I know that this is ending for, for, I know it's going to support me in my growth. Right. But then there's this simultaneous aspect of like, but what if I would have done this different or this different, or maybe it could have been different, but like deep down the deep, like gut instincts knowing is like no it played it's played its role it's played itself out and it was time to let go right and we have trouble letting go generally i think yeah i don't want to speak for everyone i'll I'll speak for myself i can have trouble letting go without realizing it also comfort like Uh, you get used to a situation you get used to a way of being and i think there's like you know there's some pain in, in in letting that go and discomfort and choosing differently and being in a different situation, being inhabiting a different part of yourself. Definitely. So. Have you found it true though to be? Because um, this is this has been my experience, so I'm curious if it's similar on your end. Is the more awake and aware I become, and the, the better I get at trusting the in, intuitive knowing, it's like the less time I spend in habitual patterning, and so like where it used to be like a five to one, you know, it's like a five, five parts anxiety. And like, this is a huge deal. And what am I going to do? And oh my God, to one part peace. Now it's like, you know, one or two parts anxiety and overwhelm to like five parts peace, <laughs> right? Like it's, it's, it's much better. <laughs> it's like things are getting consistently more i just settle in more and like give less fucks if you will in a, in a positive way right yeah no that's a good thing it's nice when you don't have many fucks left in your fuck bag. <laughs> yeah. um what do i notice here's the thing i i notice that's i feel like sometimes the the more i open up the more i become aware the more i grow the more shit that, pops up that i have to deal with about myself that i didn't realize was there you know yeah. Because I'm in a place, I think part of, to use the word healing, you know, is part of then being strong enough or being able to see parts of yourself that you might not have been able to witness before. Mm-hmm. And so then it's like, oh, that's still there. Oh, like, I didn't even realize that. Like, I'll give you an example. So this is, I was in the kitchen the other day and I was going to eat an avocado. And I go to get the avocado and it's perfect. It's ripe. You know, avocados is either, it's a hit or miss. It's like, you got to get it right on the day. Otherwise yeah. it's gone. Right. Yeah. And it's like the perfect, it's perfectly ripe, ready to eat. And the first thought that comes into my mind is, oh, maybe I should save it. And I caught myself. That is so illogical. Why would I save a ripe avocado? It's going to go bad. Where the hell does that come from? Luckily, I have a fantastic therapist. Yeah. So I was able to go, and I, and I am such a strong believer in partnership, not only the work that I do, but the wonderful partners I've had. So I go to my therapist. I'm like, what, what, what's up with the fucking avocado? Like, why? Where did that thought? And she's been with me for a while. She's like, well, you had a chaotic childhood. You had to brace for impact often. Mm, you know, so, right. you know, grew up in, you know, there's partying, alcohol, moving things. So it was like, there's a lot of moving pieces all the time. Mm-hmm. And so she said, maybe there's a part of you that felt if you allowed yourself to enjoy the moment, to enjoy what was here, you would become porous or vulnerable mm-hmm. and, and, and wouldn't have enough reserves for whatever might be coming. 
Right. So you well, see, the belief started to be implanted there. Yes. And I was not aware that that this and that I was denying myself pleasure often because yeah. I was like, oh, if I feel too pleasurable, then maybe I'll be really vulnerable. Yeah. So when something bad bad happens, I won't be able to sh handle it. And as a kid, yeah, I guess that that actually did serve me. I was like, oh, I've got to because things did come at me that I was, oh, what, you know, and so I did need some reserves, but I'm an adult now. I got this. I can handle whatever comes my way, creatively responding to life, but it remained and I didn't see it until, and I'm going back and I wrote a chapter about it in the book and I interviewed my therapist as well. Mm -hmm. So that was really fun. When I went back, because this is also about, you know, creatively directing your life is becoming aware of the narratives and the beliefs that are operating in the background and then choosing an upgrade Yes, that serves you more. Right. Reprogramming so like, the computer. Okay, how do I start to <laughs> exactly? Yeah. It was definitely time for like a software update for me. Like that's an old story that's stopping me. That's deferring joy and happiness and pleasure out of fear that I won't be able to handle what what might be coming that bad. But I didn't even realize it was at play until I was in a healthier place to be able to see it. Yeah. So I don't know if that relates directly to your question, but for me, yeah, sometimes it. I'm able to be with things differently and it's a scale of one to five. And sometimes there's new things that I'm able to see that I wouldn't have been able to see before. And then I get to choose. So now I catch myself. If I'm like, oh, I have my new new pair of kicks. I have like this new pair of Nikes. I usually wouldn't want to wear them because I don't want to scuff them. That's yeah. another, there are all these like really silly examples. I want to keep them pristine and white. Like I don't want to allow myself the pleasure of like what? I'll catch myself. Like, Where are your sneakers, girl? Wear them now. Do the thing now. So it's like a retraining. So every moment I catch myself deferring, I'm like, eh. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Pleasure now, baby. Pleasure yeah. now. And and it's a practice. And life is a practice. So it's not like a destination. It's just a reminder. And I'll open more and more and more to it and trust that I, I got I got it. I got myself. Shit, bad mm. shit will come down the pipe. Bad shit. Challenges, right? Yeah. But I know I can handle whatever comes my way. So can everyone, you know, when, especially when you have a partnership and support and awareness and you can allow yourself to feel joy. I think that actually answered the question perfectly because you're recognizing it's like it, it is, it happens faster, right? The awareness, you see this piece of like, why am I doing this? And it might like hook you for a second. Right. Even if it's like 30 seconds or 10 seconds or, you know, whereas like 10 years ago, you might have just fully leaned into, oh, I should save the avocado. And like, here's why. And here's my justifications for it. And it would have become like a thing for like the next hour or the next day. You know what I mean? Like been this kind of like background program that's like weighing on us, weighing on you. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, the whole thing is it becomes it's an autopilot thing. There's no question. It's just like, oh, yeah, I'll save the avocado. You know, there's no there's no yeah. there's no there's no questioning. There's no it's just automatic like need like, oh, yeah, going to say that like it, it's just it's just a reaction back to what right. we were saying before. Right. And, and I think when we're able to see or hear and observe ourselves in a different way, again, we get to make choices. Yeah. So would like, you? Oh, so. Well, here's the here's the big fundamental question I'm I'm always asking myself, and I'm always curious for others is like, what do we do all this for? Number one, and like all this work, all this self introspection, all this awareness, and has it given you a more consistent sense of peace and contentment, and not necessarily like elation all the time but just like i'm at ease like do, would you say that this work has done that for you um in with throughout this process like like you're more at ease than you were five years ago ten years ago generally speaking 100 <laughs> percent. i mean i think life is a big mystery you know we are like the universe has a great sense of humor right? we're just born into this planet that's in one of 150 billion galaxies uh, spinning on a rock. What? Yeah. Where do yeah. we come from? What is this about? What's the story? Where do we go afterwards? Like, what's the, oh, you're not going to tell us that part either. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, and to me, sometimes I would wonder, like, just walking down the street some days, like, are people not thinking about, like, 
who the fuck am I? Where am I? What is this shit? Like, what? A lot of them are. What's happening here? Basically, I don't think. Like, I don't... <laughs> and, you know, um, sometimes I get a bit of existential angst for a moment, and then <laughs> I just remember it's a play, and it's, 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 it's like it's a game in a way, and we're meant to discover. I think... You know, the universe is in a constant state of expansion. We are also the universe expressing itself. And I believe a lot of fulfillment comes from expansion. So expansion of your awareness, expansion of yourself, like growth. Like, I feel like we're, we're part of nature. We are nature. Everything on earth grows, you know. Yeah. We are also meant to grow. So when we are in flow with our own growth, it creates fulfillment. There's a sense of of movement, there's a sense of change, and some would use the word progress, whatever the word you want to use. I like expansion because progress feels a bit judgy, but anyway, and so I think for me, that's part of the meaning of life. That's that's what my, to use, my, my spirit is calling for, is like, oh, what's next? What, how, how can I unfold? And a lot of it is a homecoming back to myself. Right. This is really interesting. Right, right. You know, it's like coming, <laughs> It's like removing layers, removing layers, removing layers and to come back. So it could be expansion can look like many different things. But I think there's a lot of joy. There's a lot of fulfillment in it because I right. think that's what we're we're born to do. Well, I think that that is. There's kind of a twofold sort of statement or comment on how have about that. So it's like on one hand, like it. We're, we're removing layers. It's the realization, oh, I'm not this, not this, not this, not this. And like, and, and as that scene, the, the layers kind of drop on their own from what I've seen. It's like, it's not about mm. forcibly removing the layers. It's just coming back, recognizing, seeing, seeing, seeing. And eventually they just, they just lose their grip, right? And then mm. what I've found and what I'm grappling with right now I say grappling lightly because that can sound a little violent, but um, <laughs> is this crossover between like my trust and my faith in God or spirit or universe um, in the sense of my human self, my con still conditioned self trusting that higher knowing. And then also there's this simultaneous realization that the very thing that's putting that spirit or God or whatever outside of me as some sort of thing that I need to trust, like the self, the human self, as I'm like seeing that and it's working on one hand because there is that human, there is this kind of this co-creative process going on with the universe, right? And there is a, a localized person and there is a out there from what we can see, right? Simultaneously, while that's happening, there's this background knowing that like, actually I'm the source of it all. Mm. That actually the thing that's looking for the answers is ultimately what I will ultimately come back to. Like the thing that's looking is the answer. It's like, I already possess what I'm looking for. And yet there's mm -hmm. still this, there's still this forward, outward, almost compulsive, like I can't help it movement. And that's like a process that happens as a human being to getting back to yourself, to coming back to like, oh, it, it reminds me of, um, so one of my favorite spiritual teachers, I think you might know who he is, Adi Shanti. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where he talks okay. about, he's like, he's like, the whole time it's like, you're searching for God walking in God's palm. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the realization is, there's something else I was, I was gonna, bring that to is that uh like that's oh oh the best like spiritual teaching or the best spiritual modality is the one that wears you out the quickest the one that like gets you to stop looking fastest and realize oh the thing that's been chasing or looking that's that like that's why it's said that people who realize this on a very deep level this enlightenment part laugh because they're like my whole life i've been searching for something outside to fulfill me mm. and the whole time it's been the thing that's been looking the thing <laughs> like it's like the whole idea of the backward step so it's like i 
and then 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 the search can be called off, but it's not a, it's not a conscious calling off. It's not like the self, the ego is like, oh, I can call it off. It just drops. Like that's kind of, and I've been experiencing that dissonance between like, there's still some shreds of me that are like chasing and searching. And then there's this other part that's that, that sees the futility of it. And there's times where it drops and everything opens up. What are you chasing here. and searching for? That's the thing is like, there's still parts of the mind that have momentum around them that are looking for like some sort something to hold on to some kind of pleasure chase some kind of some kind of something that that is lasting like that is ultimately fulfilling and then i'll have the realization of like oh it's actually right here like there's nothing outside of this moment like, and I can just mm. relax, I can relax into even that momentum. I can relax even into like the, the idea of chasing and not, not actually like when I see it, when the awareness happens and I see that that's what's going on and I see where it leads is I see where it, le it leads to dissatisfaction. And that doesn't mean I shouldn't enjoy things and that I, that I shouldn't enjoy the moment and enjoy pleasure, enjoy all of all that life has to offer. But the difference is, is that now I know that it won't cause ultimate fulfillment. I see. And so there's that, like, there's still this, like, kind of lapse into thinking that it will, and then the awareness that it won't. So there's this kind of, like, back and forth thing going on. Is that, if that makes sense at all? What, yeah, what have you experienced, or what do you imagine ultimate fulfillment to feel like? Like it feels like the weight of need is gone. Mm -hmm. It's like the weight of half of, of this of this like incessant desire to like succeed or to like live up to some ideal or to some image drops. And I've had it drop. Like I've experienced it dropping and it's like this, like almost like weightlessness that happens. Mm -hmm. And so then when the fog, it's like this fog sort of lifts and this is like a term, a, 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 a metaphor that I heard recently where this guy, he, he talked about like, he's like, I had this experience where the fog lifted and then I got fearful. So I was like, what if it sets back in again? And so I've had it lift and then it, I've had it set back in and then lift, but it's getting like shorter. Like it's like the rotation, the circular mm -hmm. aspect of it is like, it's closing. But also when it settles back in, it's so much sharper because I've experienced the absence of it. <laughs> what, what makes it, what makes it shorter? What, what has helped you shorten the, it, the fog stay? the length of its stay realization like awareness that it that it doesn't work so it's not it's not like i don't see it as like a spiritual it's, it's nothing like spiritual anymore it's just utilitarian it's like oh when i'm pleasure seeking mm -hmm. when i'm caught in the mind when i'm caught in old patterns it's not that it's wrong or bad or that it should or shouldn't be it just doesn't work like for, for based on yeah. based on if I say I want to feel freedom and I want to feel that lack or um, absence of weight of self of weight of chasing of thinking I'm going to find it out there somewhere in the future if I want to feel that then I have to yeah. see that it doesn't work right over and yeah, over true. and over Absolutely. again until it sticks until you learn yeah and eventually it yeah. sticks and, and yeah. that's the thing is like counterintuitive piece of this is like our minds want to be like well how do i make it stick that's what my mind says it's like how do i make it stick and it's like well that's the very thing that wants to make it stick is is the, the thing that's in the way and so it just takes yeah, a seeing. Absolutely. it takes a continued awareness and seeing until like like your avocado it ripens and then eventually the apple just falls from the tree 
if you will. Right, so like on one hand, there's, <laughs> this reminds me of another beautiful paradoxical quote. It's like, it's like enlightenment is almost like a cosmic accident. Like you can't make it happen, but there are things you can do to make yourself accident prone. <laughs> right. That's so. great. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I'm of. I agree that there are some things, especially the future seeking thing. I, I think that's encoded in our culture. So yeah. it's part of our cultural programming that when you do this, when you get there, when you have this, then you will be safe, happy, fill in whatever blank you want to fill in. Yeah. So, you know, it's what we're sold. Self-advertising, right? I mean, that's, that's like the basis of that. No, it's not true. It helps the machinery of capitalism run, right? Yeah. If you never have enough, if you're not enough, and you always need more, you're going to keep the system running, right? right? Right. Because you always need to have something else. Advertising right. works on that very system, that very premise, like not beautiful enough, not sexy enough, not, you know, you need these things. You're not ethical enough, whatever, you know, to, there's something missing, and you need to chase the thing until you get it, because until then you will not feel what you're seeking, what you're yearning to feel. Yeah, you won't feel. So complete. I just want to throw that into the pot. Yeah. yeah, complete happy. I mean, everyone has their own free, you know, their own different feelings that they're that they're seeking from the thing. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not the thing; it's the feeling that behind the thing. The feeling the thing might give you, and becoming aware of what that feeling is that you're seeking is a first step to creating it for yourself now. Like, oh, I really want to feel free. And that's why I'm seeking, I'm chasing this thing. Okay, what might you do now that would make you feel free? Well, maybe I'll take a really deep breath. Right. Maybe I'll go for a walk. Maybe I'll not, you know, be stuck to my phone thinking if I don't check or respond to social media, my business will tank, whatever, right? right. You can start to create that feeling now. Um, so I just wanted to throw that into the pot because it's not only, I think it's it's part of the narrative that we're all being scripted or told. And so it becomes that much more per pervasive and sometimes difficult to be, to like snap out of, right? Mm -hmm. It's really like, hey, you have it all. Just by being alive, you won the fucking lottery. Like you're here, you're alive. Everything's available to you in this moment. You are enough as you are. How is that? Like, that's revolutionary for most, myself included. Like, you need to ground into that energy. Like, oh, shit, it's all here. I have everything I need. This is, you know. So I think that's also a practice of coming back to the present, coming back and, and catching yourself when you're seeking outside, whether it's spirituality or God or whether it's the Mercedes and success, right. whatever that looks like to you. It's it's the same chase, different, different carrots. Um, right. So it's interesting. I think there are a lot of parallels people could relate to when it comes to the chase. And for me, I don't know, this is my personal thing. What gives me grace and what grounds me is I spent most of my life without knowing it, moving from an energy of fear, mm -hmm. not being aware. And there are valid reasons for it. So it's not a judgment call. It's just when I became aware of the energy behind the drive, the this, the that, the... <clears throat> It was like, I don't want to live my life, the next half of my life being driven by fear, not interested. I want to anchor the energy and trust. And how different will my actions be when I come from a place of, hey man, whatever happens, I trust it's going to be for my own good, my own growth. That doesn't mean it's going to work out perfectly or that I'm going to be given everything I want. No, 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 it's not how it works. It means that I trust that everything I'm being served is if in my service, is for my growth, is for my own evolution, if you will, or whatever the word. So I don't know, that feels different. That feels free. That feels safe. That feels lovely. Yeah. And that's a re-patterning. Like that's like a re, and like it's like um, Michael Singer's the, the, the Surrender Experiment. He says it beautifully in that book. It's like, what if I just surrender to life? Like what happens when I just trust and I let go and I stop trying to grab, hold, control, and I trust and I just release into it? What happens? Right. right? I'm going to experiment with it. I mean, he was next level awakened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, me. But yeah. um, on my own plateau, I'm going to like catch myself and make different decisions because you, you, you make a lot of different choices when you are powered by trust 
aka love and not fear. Right, right. And sometimes it takes, for me at least, that reorienting. Like sometimes I'll, I'll like get so wrapped up in the day to day that I'll like have to like intentionally reorient myself to that trust. Um, totally yeah same i think that's what i mean practice it's a daily practice it's not like oh one and done i figured it out woohoo i'm moving with trust right it's gonna be good from here on in i mean it doesn't work that way especially if you've been deepening the same neural pathway for a very long time you know right. it, 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 it you need a fresh some fresh snow you need it's to sit a, back and let the snow fall and choose differently it's literally a rewiring of your brain like of your, totally. your, your patterns and, and to go back to the capitalism thing like there is some legitimacy to that because like at a, to a certain degree like there's survival there's food there's shelter there's water there's um you know not working a job that i absolutely hate you know what i mean before it's like the, once those things i found are taken care of or like you find your way out of those which is a lot of time to, to drive to get out of those, then you could start introspecting more because you have more time you have more creativity you have more freedom there's not the that pressing oh i have to like live like i have to survive i have to get out of no this, absolutely like, i mean that, weight, right that's an important thing to note but also for anyone listening is that you know or everyone listening it, it yeah there is a certain privilege of that you you are in your past survival mode whatever right. that looks like to you right that you can survive and then from there obviously there are more choices available to you so there are some things that are really real but there are also some things that are not scarcity yeah. mm -hmm. i was listening to this really he was a economic anthropologist and he spoke about scarcity is is it there it's made up there's a there's enough for everybody it's the problem is some people have more than others so it's, right. it's so there creates scarcity but re, from a resource perspective we are resource mm -hmm. well yeah there's there there's disparate amounts of resources that haven't been equally distributed so it creates a, a sense of scarcity i thought that was really interesting Right. It just makes you question narratives. That's the key word is it creates a sense, an idea of scarcity. When that's there what I'm saying. Isn't so, any, right? <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So it's like, yeah. it's good to just, you know, it doesn't, we're not demonizing one thing or the other. It's just more of like putting stuff under a microscope or into question or into our awareness and saying, what are the stories that are used? Back to what your question was. Yeah. My way of saying it is what's helpful or harmful for me? Mm, mm -hmm. What story scarcity for me is harmful. The yeah. story of scarcity is a very, it's not, it's, I think for most people yeah. it's quite harmful, right? Yeah. Um, that's just the that's truth. A fear. That's a fear. That's a fear. What's the truth? That it's harmful. That's not spiritual. Yeah. That's not like, it's just, that's the truth. Cut and dry, right? I agree with you. So then you just have to ask yourself is, is, is this helpful? Is this belief helpful for me or is it harmful? And you get, you choose for me. It's like, nope, no, thank you. I'm going to choose to believe that I have what I need because I am fortunate enough to have, I'm not in survival mode. So right. I, I am privileged. Um, and then beyond there to continue to think that I'm in a scarcity, you know, mode when I'm not is harmful. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And that's just the, you know, back to, Back to where we started with awareness, the seeing, this clear seeing. It's all, it's all it, it literally, that's what pierces, I found everything. It sheds light on everything. And it's, it, it, it's not, I think a big, a big leap for people is to step out of the good or bad, right or wrong aspect and just seeing it as a utility aspect of things as of like, the, okay, when I do this, it and I think this, it causes problems, causes hardship. When I act in this way and think in this way, it causes harmony and connection and openness. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's not. It's not spiritual. It's not. It's not good. It just. It's just. It's just a result. <laughs> right? It's like here's the result. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know? Here's the um, impact. Here's yeah. the impact. Yeah, but. It's interesting because I I didn't re I want to read this book. It's called The Dawn of Everything. It's okay. written by like I don't know if historians. It's 
human history, and, and I just read the beginning, and the beginning of the book is like the, the philosophical premise that a lot of our systems and societies have been built on is, is man, human, you know, are people inherently good or bad? Like, you know, Rousseau and Locke, like Locke's political philosopher of people are inherently bad, so therefore they need systems mm. and checks in place in order to be good. And right. then the opposite perspective is, no, people are naturally good. It's actually systems that corrupt. So two different ways of thinking, and it's really interesting to see how that plays out, those beliefs play out in action. And then what, there's the kicker. So what the book, so what these two men pause and say, even that's bullshit, because there's no good or bad. You know, who who said there's good good or bad in and of itself is a human made idea. Yeah. So the whole philosophy is is also skewed because we're already and and that kind of blew my mind. It's like the first level also was like, oh that's interesting. And then the second level is like, oh, but this is wrong too. Because there's no such thing or good good or bad. It's like, oh my God. Yeah. It's like everything is fucking made up, right? Yeah. Literally, it's all scam. And I think everything is made up. <laughs> everything, everything is made up, and you get to be a part of making it up too. That's yeah. that is actually also part of the premise of the book. Is what creativity is. Everything is made up, and you get uh, you get to make it make shit up too. It's on you. What do you want to make real for yourself? What do you want to make real? Right? right. What do you want to create? What experience do you want to create? Right. And I think that is so free such an awareness that that to me is like a, an awareness that's like a shake like hey guess what no one fucking knows excuse my language no one knows right well so don't worry about it no one knows no one knows where we're going no one knows why we're here no one knows anything don't worry yeah. about it you know it doesn't mean they're not some people who are very well versed in you know funnels or whatever it is i'm sure but at the end of the day no one really knows everyone's just figuring it. everyone's just figuring it out moving along and i don't know i find that a very freeing thought i do too because it's it leaves it up to you to tell your own story and create yes as it amen is, right so <laughs> i think we should uh let's let's end on that i do have to get going and we're at about a, an hour almost an hour and 20 so this has been awesome i always love talking to you it has yeah. i always love speaking with you it's been we've traveled to many places and what a beautiful ending yeah. What a beautiful way to tie the bow, you know? Yeah, yeah. all is well it's been, it's been and great. write your own Thank story, you. you know? So. <laughs> all um, is well and right. No one knows all is well. It's all made up. Yeah. So write your own story. Yeah. Make it your own. Exactly. It's all malleable. <laughs> um, so where can people... It really is. Where can people find you? How can they reach out to you to get connected if they want coaching or just want to chat? Absolutely. Collective Studio, two Ks. I can link in the notes, I'm sure. Yeah. Notes, I'm sure. yeah, yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a great way to get a taste of the work that I do and who I am. And then on X, it's where we connected, Pia Lister, at Pia Lister. That's where I'm most active. And then, you know, there's LinkedIn, but, you know, those are those are the main ways. And I'll be sharing more about my book and inviting people along to become part of the Creative Club community and join the journey, which I would absolutely love. So in two weeks, I'll have a live link for that as well. Awesome, I dig it. Thank you so much for uh, hanging out and coming on. And Thank you. Know, it was great connecting with you again, so. Thanks for jamming. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. We'll talk yeah. soon, bye. bye.